author, columnist, managing editor of LibertyNation.com, podcast host and conservative policy advocate. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. Hello and welcome to Liberty Nation Radio, heard coast to coast on the Radio America Network from our flagship station in the nation's capital, WWRC. I'm your host, Mark Angelides. On today's special edition, we're joined by legendary political author and prolific columnist, Cal Thomas, to discuss the character of an election, what that means, what it means in terms of how messages are delivered to the public, and what that means that the politicians are actually fighting on. We'll also be talking with Liberty Nation's executive editor, Lisa K. Donner, on who can bring the goods for Donald Trump as a vice presidential pick. We'll also be talking with Liberty Nation's legal affairs editor, Scott Casenza, who was on the ground at the Libertarian Party nominating convention this last weekend, and ask him whether Donald Trump managed to move the needle in terms of libertarian support. All this and more on today's show. And remember, this show is proudly sponsored by LibertyNation.com. You can access podcasts, breaking news analysis, and a range of biting and brilliant shows to whet your appetite for freedom and your fondness for the great American Constitution. Barack Obama promised hope and change. Joe Biden in 2024 is promising the soul of the nation is on the line. But what is the character of this particular election? And what is the soul of which Joe Biden is talking about? We're very fortunate to have with us one of the most politically prolific authors in the nation and the nation's most widely syndicated columnist, Mr. Cal Thomas. Thanks for being here, Cal. Always a pleasure. So, Cal, let, let's address that question. Barack Obama, he was saying that this, uh, this election is about hope and change. Um, I, I guess he got half of that right. Now, well, I don't think so. We have no hope and no change now if you listen to the rhetoric in this campaign. And it's only going to get worse especially after the decision is reached in the first of several Trump trials, possibly this week in New York. Absolutely right. Yeah, um, we, we could end up with some significant historic outcome here that impacts the very future of the country, because obviously whatever happens in New York, obviously at the time of recording, the decision hasn't come down here. That's going to set precedent for going forward into uh, every election going ahead. But let, let's talk about what Joe Biden is saying this election is about. And, and also Donald Trump, to some extent, they're saying it's about the soul of the nation. What is that soul? Well, nobody really knows and can't define it. It's sort of like uh, Bill Clinton saying it depends on the meaning of the word is. <laughs> uh, I, I, this is all gobbledygook. They never define it. If you're going to use a word like that, you ought to define it. I think Biden means, uh, and he says it a lot, that if Trump is elected again, it will be the end of democracy. Well, America is not a democracy. America is a constitutional republic. And I wish they'd stop using that word because it just doesn't relate to who we are. These are buzzwords that pollsters have found resonate with certain voters they're not serious about them. They can't define them. Uh, you know, when you talk about the soul of a nation, is the soul of a nation 63 million abortions? Is it uh, same-sex marriage? Is it drag queens in public schools reading stories to little kids? Is it a $34 trillion debt with more and more being piled on top of that, not only in spending, but in interest? It is the lack of a foreign policy. Nobody knows what Joe Biden's foreign policy is. And, uh, I, you know, I don't know what that means, soul of a nation. So if I were asking Biden a question, if I could ever get to him, which I won't, uh, what do you mean by soul of a nation? I mean, it sounds like some uh, music group. Yeah, absolutely. We're putting the band back together. It's called soul yeah. of a nation. There's a, there's a term, isn't there, called strategic ambiguity in mm. foreign policy, and specifically in national security, where you kind of don't want people to know precisely what you're going to do because then, of course, they could plan against you. And that works in a theater of war. But yeah. does it or should it really work in the theater of politics when people are determining who they're going to cast their ballot for in an election? Well, the thing about strategic ambiguity, Mark, is that uh, even people who use that 
should have a goal in mind. And if you're going to get involved in a war, mm -hmm. uh, the only uh, objective is victory. Otherwise, don't get involved. I mean, Colin Powell, uh, the former Secretary of State, National Security Advisor of the first Bush administration, uh, said the same thing. Why send uh, American soldiers off to a war if you're uh, if your objective is not victory, then there's no point in getting involved in it. Uh, we have serious problems in America, as the UK and many other places do around the country, because we won't accept the answers that are readily available from our history, uh, or herstory, if you want to rewrite the language. Uh, it, it Thank is, you, Prime Minister Trudeau. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, well, you know, your pronouns are very important these days. Uh, we are getting into this silly stage of uh, pronouns and and uh, gender identity and men who think they're women playing in women's sports and all of this other crazy stuff that a tiny minority in this country promote that a massive majority don't want anything to do with. And yet they have the media in their corner. They have academia, as we've seen this spring with these horrible anti-Semitic protesters on major college campuses where it costs sixty or seventy thousand dollars a semester to go plus room and board and a bunch of other uh, expenses uh, people look at that and they th this is not the America they grew up with this this is not the America we celebrate on uh, and observe on Memorial Day where men and women gave their lives to preserve what we enjoy and love about this country this is a completely different America that is being imposed upon us by the elites and agitators and uh, people with real no skin and really no skin in the game. Yeah, it's it's fascinating how such a a, a minority situation here because a, a lot of the issues that that most animate people. For example, uh, I think this election the, the two top ones are clearly uh, the economy and illegal immigration. Now, I think for the first time ever, there's a majority of support now for deporting mm -hmm. all illegal immigrants. And that's, that's kind of unheard of. But the rhetoric out of the media, as you say, which is a very small enclave of people and, and some progressive bastions and uh, some of these college campuses, it's all for open borders. But they, they have such an outsized voice when compared to what a majority of Americans think. And it, it makes me wonder that um, when... Joe Biden is talking about the soul of the nation, whatever that happens to be in his party rhetoric, uh, perhaps it's not the same soul that the majority of Americans would recognize. Right. You're absolutely correct. And, you know, uh, Biden likes to uh, position himself as a strong Catholic. I call him a Chino, a Catholic in name only. He's a, he goes against all the teachings and traditions of his church, whether it be abortion or marriage or just about anything else. And yet the media support him at all of this and, and his flubs and his outright lies. You know, the White House recently had to put out a statement correcting nine nine errors in a relatively short speech that he made. He, he clearly is in uh, cognitive decline. And, you know, you talk about deportation. I can tell you as a veteran of the media exactly what's going to happen. The first, if Trump wins, if the deportations start, the media are going to find a crying woman holding a little baby that's crying and point out the cruelty of it all try to switch people's minds or let these people stay. Let's not forget what Obama and Biden have said repeatedly, they want to fundamentally transform America. And a major part of that is flooding the zone flooding this people for this country with people from China and Pakistan and all kinds of other countries. Fox has been the only network that has regularly covered this. You had Bill Malusian down on the border. He's asking, he's doing these interviews. Why did you come here? Most of them say jobs, few of them say freedom, but none of these things qualify under our immigration law as reasons to be admitted to the country. And then, of course, Border Patrol and the, and the legal system give them a uh, court appearance date that's 20 or 30 years from now. They're never going to show up, even if they're still alive. And, and this is what the fundamental transformation of America is about. We, we have uh, illegal immigration without assimilation. No country on earth and in history has ever been able to, to sustain itself with that kind of behavior. 
Yeah, Elon Musk uh, has been making uh, headlines. Well, maybe not so much headlines, but he's making Twitter lines or X lines, whatever they happen to be called, saying that, uh, talking about how uh, within the the census, when uh, illegal immigrants are counted amongst the population, that actually expands congressional power. Right. So you end up with, if you have an extra 1 million illegal immigrants within a certain area, well, that's going to be more congressional seats. Right. And they're also uh, now allowing illegals to vote in local elections in New York City. They tried it in the Washington, D.C., but uh, the House, which oversees uh, uh, D.C. law, uh, has overturned that, thankfully. But this is their goal. They want uh, people to come in illegally. They're going to give them free stuff, free education, free health care, uh, free phone. Uh, in New York, uh, you've got a, a free uh, debit card that Mayor Adams has handed out, free hotel rooms in New York City, free food, all kinds of other stuff. And then they're going to tell them, uh, you better vote for Democrats or those evil Republicans are going to take all your free stuff away. There's nothing, uh, you know, there's nothing new about this. You know, we have these Medicare supplement ads run on TV in America, and there are four common words in each of them, which tell you what the condition of America is today. Free, entitled, benefit, and deserve. Mm -hmm. When you say that often enough, and it, it seeps into the mindset of a new generation of Americans. Uh, you're going to think, this is where the envy comes in. Evil corporations, the rich. You know, I never envied the rich. I asked rich people, how did you become rich? Where'd you go to school? What did you study? What's your philosophy of life? I wanna be like you someday. But now the attitude is, if you make more than I do, you owe me to make it fair. That's not what capitalism is all about. We'll be back with Cal Thomas after this short break. Don't go anywhere. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. And we're back with prolific author and columnist Cal Thomas, continuing our discussion on the character of the election. Linguistic twistings have become part of our common parlance. And back to a point you made earlier, Cal, when we, when we began this, talking about how obviously America is a constitutional republic, but the term democracy is on the line. Now, I have mentioned this with... Uh, former uh, host of this show, a long-time host of this here radio show, Tim Donner. And I have a theory on why they use the term democracy. Uh, and I'd like to run it past you. If you use constitutional republic, people understand that there are certain, that, you know, this is something very specific to America. But if you use the term democracy, you're hearkening back two and a half thousand years to, a the to Athens, to, to Greek democracy. Essentially, what you're saying is democracy is on the line. What you're saying here, or what the what you're trying to get across is the idea that it's the whole of civilized Western history that is on the line. And that just makes America just a blip. So we can forget about America. We've got to protect Western civilization, two and a half thousand years of it. And, mm. and that's a lot more powerful than a constitutional republic because a lot of people don't even like the constitution. Well, you have to define your terms once again. I mean, there are a lot of words that are being thrown around. People have their own definition, but that may not necessarily be the real definition. You have Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and a lot of the other left-wing Democrats who believe in a kind of democracy where there is no more electoral college, where New York and California, the two biggest states in America, get to decide who is president. And what is the majority in New York and California? Democrats. Mm. So they want a pure democracy because they believe that they can uh, swing enough votes to their party to have uh, a Democrat president and Congress in perpetuity. So when you hear them use the words democracy, what they really mean is get rid of the Electoral College, the equality of all 50 states, and allow the big states, meaning Democrats, to uh, vote for president and the Senate and the House and never have a Republican win another election. How many Democrats would get whiplash if Florida and Texas became the largest states? Well, it's funny, you know, they, they thought they had Virginia in their pocket, mm. and then Virginia elected Glenn Youngkin, who's been a terrific governor and a Republican. Uh, you had uh, Trump going to the Bronx, of all places, in New York recently, and uh, making a pitch for Black and Latino votes. This is really worrying Democrats. It's worrying them so much that they're on programs like MSNBC and CNN saying, oh, he'll never get those votes. And yet the polls show a sharp decline, especially among the young, 
young and young black and Hispanic voters in approval of uh, Democrats and Joe Biden uh, specifically. Now we're only what five months away now for the from the general election. Those attitudes have sunk in, and they're not going to be turned around overnight. No matter what the Biden administration does, and calling Trump an enemy of democracy, they really hope he is convicted in this New York trial because then Biden says, "I'll be running against a convicted felon." Let's talk about Donald Trump for a moment. Let, let's uh, dig a little deeper into how Donald Trump's managing his campaign. As you pointed out earlier in the show, uh, he's, he's, he's campaigning in the Bronx, where he ended up with, I think it's estimated around 25,000 attendees. He was, in, um, he was in New Jersey with 80 to 100,000 people turning up. Now, these are, let, let's be very clear, that they're not going to, to turn red on this election cycle. It, it's, it's really unlikely to happen. I think New York State, the, the uh, Ronald Reagan, I think, was the last to, to win New York State. Uh, but before that, uh, Ronald Reagan, and then prior to that was Richard Nixon, who had been rejected by New York State uh, twice, but then uh, won again in, 70, in 1972. But I, I think there's something very important to look at here is that you have Donald Trump's campaigning in these areas where it's highly unlikely, almost impossible that he's going to, to win. And then you have Joe Biden, who's, well, he's done, uh, at time of recording, he's done five visits to Philadelphia, seven visits to Pennsylvania and all, you know, just crossing the bridge there from, from Delaware. And he's not really getting out into the battleground states. Why is that? Well, he's not drawing crowds either. I mean, he, he couldn't draw a crowd that would f barely fit in a phone booth. There's no enthusiasm for him. If you look at these Trump crowds, they're incredibly enthusiastic, mm -hmm. chanting and singing and having a good time. Where are the Biden crowds? There aren't any. He's not popular. Uh, there are a lot of people who just knee-jerk vote Democrat. And yes, sometimes that's true of Republicans as well. But here's the key about going into places like the Bronx and uh, uh, and New Jersey and and other places where uh, he has difficulty or has had difficulty last time. He's sending a signal to the rest of the country, to blacks and Hispanics and other minorities and the rest of the country that he cares about us. I remember Jack Kemp, the late congressman and HUD secretary, who uh, used to call himself a, a bleeding heart conservative. He would go into places like Cabrini Green and East St. Louis, and he had credibility with especially uh, black people because of his football career. He once said, it was really funny, a great line, I've showered with more black people than are in the Republican Party. Now that was funny, but, and it had a lot of truth in it. But more and more, I think you're seeing in the polls and you're seeing in interviews, uh, words from uh, especially black people who say, what has he done for us? Our schools are a mess. The crime is a mess. Uh, it, it's, it, you can't walk down the street if you're a woman alone and even a man sometimes without looking over your shoulder and be, you're getting cold cocked on subways in New York. Uh, you're getting, uh, uh, you know, pushed off the subway tracks. I mean, it, it is just, uh, the crime is terrible. And you mentioned, uh, you know, 1972. Well, let's go back four years earlier, 1968, where crime was a major problem. Riots at the Democratic Convention. There are a lot of parallels. I think there are going to be riots at this Democratic convention this year at the end of August. And uh, that could count for a lot as people are watching their TV screens and seeing their uh, nation falling apart. As they say, uh, history doesn't always repeat, but it does often rhyme. Cal Thomas, yes. thank you ever so much for being with us. Always a pleasure, Mark. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. The vice presidential pick can be either a thing of legend, a builder of legacies, or the biggest liability your campaign might have. So who's picking whom and what's going on for this election cycle? We're very lucky to have with us Liberty Nation's executive editor, Lisa K. Donner. Thanks for being here, Lisa. Good to be with you, Mark, Mr. Editor-in-Chief. Welcome and congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, Lisa, I really want to talk about the VP picks. Now, of course, all the news is about who Donald Trump's going to choose for the second slot. Now, I believe that information's coming uh, just before the Republican National Convention, so that would make it around the 13th or 14th, just before it kicks off, or he might announce at the actual thing. But first, I want to talk about a VP pick 
who's already in place, and that would be Vice President Kamala Harris. Now, is she, as I alluded to in the introduction here, is she a legacy builder? Is she a legend in her own break time? Or is she a liability to Joe Biden? Well, the problem with Kamala Harris or Kamala Harris or Kamala or however. Ms. Harris. Yeah, Ms. Harris. VP is, Harris. Let's do that. Let's do that. VP yeah, Harris. Try it. They might. The Democrats can't seem to find a place for her that sort of works. Even mm. though she's vice president, she just seems to be, you know, you put her in uh, the immigration topic and she doesn't seem to do much with it. You put her in other topics, she do, does, doesn't seem to excel there. So any way you cut it, she's turning out to be a liability. And at the same time, Biden can't exactly cut her. So that that's a given. He's He's got to work with that. And there's no place for him to go with that, I think, at this point. It just is what it is. Yeah, I, I think that that's pretty much the situation everybody's determined at. And it's more important this time than any other, because Joe Biden is a gazillion years old. Uh, I'm not sure. I think 81 years old, I think he is, or 82. Uh, well, the problem with Biden is you can't use numbers, because I know a lot of 81-year-olds that are pretty with it. Of course, of course. He doesn't seem particularly with it, which is the problem, I think, with him. Absolutely. Um, but there's a chance that he might not be around for the entire term. It's there, and we should we should talk about it openly. And that means that Vice President Kamala Harris could become President Kamala Harris by default without going through an election. Now, it's my it's just a personal opinion here, but I don't think that Kamala Harris would do particularly well if she were running by herself for the presidency. I I, I don't believe that she would get the necessary support, even from groups who are generally supportive of the Democrat Democratic Party, because she seems to, as you pointed out, every project she takes on, it's not as though she says, I'm done with this project. It's over. I've either completed it or failed. She just kind of moves on quietly. And nobody in the media will mention again that she was the border czar designed to figure out the root causes and solve them. Well, she's suffering from what I call Dan Quayle-itis, and this and this isn't to be mean to Dan Quayle. Dan Quayle had a lot going for him, but for some reason, the public perception of him was somebody who's not too bright, somebody who's not too with it. And so, and whether true or not, that was the public perception. Also, I think Ms. Harris has the issue of the likability factor. Yeah. And that's what really brought Hillary Clinton down. People did not like her. They just couldn't cotton to her. And I I think that's the problem that Ms. Harris has in the VP position. She may be able to actually get up to snuff on the position, but the perception of her has always been rather negative. And her poll numbers have always been really, really quite low. Well, now that uh, Mitch McConnell is stepping down from leadership role, she is the most unpopular leadership politician in the country, leadership role politician yeah. in the country. And that's that's not even by a, a small margin. Uh, and it hasn't been the, for a short time yeah. either. Before all the conservatives turn us off, let's get to the real funny. Yeah, let's get let's get to the big question. Now, we Donald Trump. Now, uh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna start out by saying I talked you into reading Hillbilly Elegy. Yes. It, which is JD Vance's first book. Yes, so J.D. Vance's uh, book, Hillbilly Elegy, it's, it's beautiful and it's poignant. And as an Englishman, which uh, it might surprise a few of our American listeners, who obviously the majority of our listeners, uh, it, it resonated with me in, in a way that surprised me and moved me to, to quite a degree because what J.D. Vance was describing about his upbringing, that's what that's what so many young brits when they're growing up that's what we feel there's this disconnect there's this almost expectation that we have to make an excuse for why we're failing or why we're going to fail yeah and it really blew me away that there was such a comparison there and of course jd vance in in, in the book he he notes that the description that he's using of the uh the hillbillies is the same words and it's the same things that using to describe southern blacks 
in yeah. America. Mm. And it's really, it, it's, it's a much more universal book than you might imagine if you haven't read it. And, but not for that reason, not for the book that he wrote, do I believe that J.D. Vance will be, that's my, my prediction, by the way, I believe he will be the VP pick for Donald Trump. Lisa, tell me why I'm wrong. Well, a couple of things. You could see the, the change in his political philosophy through mm. that book. You just knew, you, he started cut very left of center, then moved to the center. And I don't know that he made the complete metamorphosis before he finished the book. You could tell where he was going, which is what I'm seeing in a lot of younger people, millennials. I just had uh, some people out Saturday, and we were all talking and swimming and barbecuing and having fun. And the young lady there was always very, very left of center. And now she is a big Trump supporter. And it was quite, quite a change. Um, 22 years old, um, you know, went to lots of marches and rallies uh, early on, and then just started to see what she felt, in her words, was the bankruptcy of the left. And you could see Vance doing that. I don't think Vance is a good pick for a couple of reasons. Number one, Ohio is not really in play. And sure. I'm from the old school. I believe that LBG, um, JFK picked LBJ, and that's what put him over the top, really. Um, he needed Texas. He had to have Texas. And, um, and of course, a little help from his friends in Illinois. But anyway, long story short, I think Trump needs somebody that's going to help him in the Electoral College. Sure. Rubio does not feel that. In fact, Rubio has the problem of being from the same state. Twelfth Amendment. Has, yeah. Twelfth Amendment issue there. DeSantis has that same problem. I heard people talking about Nikki Haley. And the funny thing about Nikki Haley is that you get two polar opposite reactions. Mm. Half the people are like, no, never. Don't pick Haley. And the other half are like, no, this makes sense because she speaks to the suburban women. And she's kind of moderate on the abortion issue, which is a strength for Biden at this point. So I, I'm sort of startled at how divisive the idea of Nikki Haley is. I, I'm not saying she she will be picked. My pick is actually Tim Scott. I think um, Scott brings he's the yin to Trump's yang. Mm. Not going to bring that electoral college help because South Carolina. South Carolina. Um, but I, I do think he is a cool customer and Trump can tend to run, run hot. So yeah, the, the, I like the, the calm versus together. the storm. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know what, and, and I think we should look up maybe, uh, what the perception of Tim Scott is among the black community. Cause Trump is really working hard for the black vote. He didn't go to the Bronx by chance mm. he went to the Bronx for a purpose and, a ton of people showed up for a reason. So back to our original question then, Lisa. Legacy builder, legend, or liability? Will the VP pick for Donald Trump make, will that be the thing that moves the needle for Donald Trump in 2024? Well, I'm on the fence. Uh, part of it makes me say the trial right now might move the needle. Uh, but who he picks as a VP uh, ultimately, I think, will matter a lot. And it's got to be somebody that, you know, polls pretty well, um, speaks to the people that are maybe on the fence about Trump and brings something to the ticket. You just need somebody that brings something to the ticket. And of course, Donald Trump will want to drag it out as much as possible in an apprentice style format. Lisa K. Donna. Why not? Why not? Absolutely. The, the, the greatest show on earth. Lisa K. Donna, thanks ever so much for joining us. Thank you, Mark. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. The Libertarian Party of America recently held its national nominating convention and on the scene was Liberty Nation's legal affairs editor, Mr. Scott Casenza. Scott, thanks for coming in. Cheers, Mark. Welcome. Or <laughs> Cheers, Mark. Thank you. You were you going to welcome me to the Libertarian Party convention, weren't you there? Now, uh, you, you had some great articles out, which uh, poor Scott wrote overnight to get on the opening pages of LibertyNation.com, sponsor of this show. Uh, but also, he had an opportunity to speak with uh, party members there, delegates, the, the hoi polloi of the libertarian world. And, and I think 
although many people might not consider the Libertarian Party to be uh, a major force in American polit politics today, it, it actually is, isn't it, Scott? Because in, in some ways, because as you made mention in your reporting on the pages of Liberty Nation, the margin of which the Libertarian Party claimed the presidential vote in 2020 was greater in a couple of locations than the margin of victory. More than a couple, by the way, yeah. uh, and, and approaching uh, even more than that. It was approaching, I think, five. I think there were, there were three states where it eclipsed the, the, the margin of victory, and in two others, it was very close. So if one candidate can effectively appeal to libertarians and steal a lot of those votes away from the libertarian candidate, meaning one of the candidates being one of the Joe Biden or Donald Trump, the presumed nominees from the Republican and Democrat Party, that might make the measure of uh, a victory for them. Well, as we know, the elections come down to really uh, seven swing states across the country. The, the other states are pretty much locked up. We know where they're going to go. Uh, which way they're going to jump. Oh, and my state day. count, by the way, was for battleground or swing Absolutely states. it was. Absolutely yes. it was. So it's kind of important to, to figure out just how much support each of the main contenders. We, we, we should not ignore that Robert uh, F. Kennedy Jr. was also in attendance on the Friday evening uh, for the Libertarian Party convention. But for the two main candidates, the ones who Actually, had... he was Friday. he was Friday afternoon and Vivek Ramaswamy uh, was Friday evening, just for the record. Well, the, the evenings are for the younger guys, right? That's, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. how it works. Um, Joe Biden would, would have been, if he were attending, he would have been on at 7 a.m. in the morning. He um, was an invitee, by the way, who, who declined to participate. He refused to go. Um, now, whether that was a scheduling thing or if he just didn't feel he had anything to offer the libertarians, well, that's, that's another question. But let's talk about your experience of the libertarians there and what their perception of the speech made by Donald Trump was, and did it seem that Donald Trump would be able to shave off a significant proportion of libertarian voters who, as Trump pointed out in his speech, it's around 3%. Uh, in most elections, it's around 3% that they, they, they claim. Will he be able to shave off a significant portion of those voters to back him come November 2024? I think the answer is yes, Mark, as uh, we broke the news on uh, Saturday night for, with confirmation from the libertarian uh, side of things. The Trump campaign made a deal or Trump made a deal with, uh, with the libertarians to announce from the stage that he would pardon Ross Ulbricht on his first day in all, or excuse me, I misspoke. He would commute the sentence of Ross Ulbricht on his first day in office as president, should he win? Ulbricht is the founder of the Silk Road uh, black market website who was convicted of nonviolent crimes that accrued to double life plus some more time in federal prison and became a cause celeb for libertarians ever since because what he did was he created a marketplace for uh, basically where people could exchange Bitcoin for uh, either prescription drugs or illegal drugs, taking away the street dealing uh, violence element to purchasing or selling drugs. Um, he didn't sell any drugs himself that we know of, just established that marketplace. But in any case, uh, we have a system where people who are committed horribly violent crimes against others and don't get uh, you know a fraction of the time that Ulbricht got for this nonviolent crime. So it was a huge deal. I spoke to many people who were committed libertarians who wouldn't have thought to vote outside of the Libertarian Party. But when that happened, they, they said they would absolutely support Donald Trump uh, in November for president of the United States. Okay. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., independent candidate, was also uh, vying for their support. And more, he also put his name down to be considered as the Libertarian Party candidate for yeah president during their nominating convention. That didn't work out too well, did it? No. And I don't think that you'll see any libertarians break for non-traditional candidates. They would just go, they would just vote libertarian. So mm. if you were willing to vote for a candidate who was certainly going to lose in the election, um, you probably wouldn't support a candidate other than a libertarian candidate. The reason to, to go for Trump would be that you think 
collectively your votes might make a difference in choosing Trump over Biden, for instance, and that you prefer Trump over Biden as a libertarian. And that's what Trump was there fighting for. And I thought he did a good job of appealing to those notions, even outside of the Ulbricht commutation uh, promise. His appeal was very much to libertarians on libertarian terms, discussing his achievements uh, that could be supported, you know, from a libertarian perspective, including no new wars, uh, things like that. Yeah, it, it it surprised me that that there's so few people are behind the idea of no new wars. That, that <laughs> right, right. It's it's one of those things. You, who doesn't want that? But uh, clearly, yeah. that there's yeah. a, a large swath of. If I could just could. add one other thing, by the way, if we talk just about the coverage that Trump's appearance uh, got. I saw many articles that led with you know, Trump booed from libertari mm -hmm. by libertarians at the convention, and that is true, but it's a lie. Meaning, it's a lie if that's if you're making one story about Trump at the Libertarian Convention and you just headline it that he was booed there, and that's your takeaway. That's a lie because it doesn't report the true nature of the reception that he got, which was that most of the the assembled there, who who by the way, had committed to going before they knew Trump was going to be there. They were there to discuss the business of the Libertarian Party, not to welcome Donald Trump, but they did welcome Donald Trump and thought that it was good that he was coming to them to address their concerns. And that was, you know, to both of their, uh, their credits, meaning they were happy that Donald Trump was addressing them and listening to them, and they were willing to receive him. There was some uh, participation there by Libertarians who thought they shouldn't have him, at all at the show, uh, at the convention, but I was there Friday, Saturday, and, and, and Sunday, and the overwhelming sentiment was that people were happy that Trump came to address them and, uh, and were happy for the attention to, uh, to libertarians and libertarian principles. Next, you'll be telling me the Libertarian Party is the new Al Sharpton uh, of, the <laughs> of the political right. Now, actually, that, that's a question to ask there. Is the Libertarian Party on the political right, or is it on the left, or is it somewhere in between? I don't think libertarians belong in either bucket, Mark. The chief concerns of libertarians are that they uh, want non-intervention in foreign policy. They want reduced uh, government oversight of people's lives, especially in including uh, taxes and regulations. They want to keep their money and not have it be spent by government bureaucrats. And those are the those are the big deals, just using the mechanism of the government to keep the people free to make as many decisions within the private sphere as possible, rather than having many decisions be in the government sphere. So you think with uh, Donald Trump's talk of uh, refusing to engage with the idea that there'll be, for example, a central uh, bank digital currency that he he nixed during his speech, you think that appeals to the libertarian perspective? I like the way you put that question by saying, you said refuse to engage with the uh, central bank digital currency when he did. And the reason why I think mm. it what's so important is that Donald Trump didn't refuse to engage with the libertarians. He did come out and engage with them and his mixing it up with them, his willing to go to be at an audience, unlike any he's spoken to before, where lots of people uh, disagreed with him on fundamental issues, I think accrues to Trump's benefit. Mm. You know, it's written up like it's a weakness. Oh, he was booed or he got criticized. No, no. Can you imagine Joe Biden going to an audience where he was greeted hostily by some significant margin of the crowd? It's almost impossible to think about and to speak extemporaneously uh, before them. But yes, the his knowledge of the crypto world and Bitcoin that Trump uh, evidenced in his talk was, I think, uh, like throwing uh, red, red meat to the dogs of, uh, you know, libertarianism from, from the stage. Well, we'll see if they come out for him in November. Scott Casenza, thanks ever so much for being with us. Thanks, Mark. And that's about all we have time for on this week's special edition of Liberty Nation Radio, heard coast to coast on the Radio American Network. I've been your host, Mark Angelis. I'd like to thank our guests, Cal Thomas, Lisa K. Donna, and Scott D. Casenza. Thank you all for being here. And I'd like to extend my thanks to you, the listeners at home, who take the time each week to tune in and join the fun. Thanks for being here. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides.